Let us hear the word of God that we find it in the 8th chapter of John's Gospel and reading from verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And we let end our reading at verse 36, and we know that the Lord will bless his word to all our hearts. We know as orange men were to read the scriptures and study the scriptures and we're delighted this afternoon to have the county grand chaplain brother joe andrews uh, to deliver god's word to us this afternoon brother andrews <coughs> county grand master worshipful district master brethren and friends First of all, can I say a very big word of thanks to the officers and members of Money Moor District for inviting me to minister God's Word at our demonstration today and also thank them for their very kind uh, hospitality. It is a, a pleasure and a privilege to be joining with our brethren in the south of the county as we mark the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne seems to me that every year that passes becomes a year of more and more anniversaries. 2007 is of course the 317th anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne. It's also the 60th anniversary of the marriage of Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. It is the 300th anniversary of the Act of Union between England and Scotland. And it is the 200th anniversary of a world-changing event. An event which took place in 1807 when the, uh, that, that, that changed British politics when the House of Commons voted to abolish the slave trade throughout the British Empire. Now that vote marked the culmination of a campaign which had commenced its parliamentary phase some 17 years earlier, when a man called William Wilberforce presented the first abolition bill to Parliament. In those verses of scripture which were read for us this afternoon, Jesus takes up the theme, indeed he does more than take up the theme, he draws attention to the reality of the slavery of the human race. Wilberforce's work highlighted a physical form of slavery. Jesus' words highlight a worse form of slavery. A slavery which blights not merely a race of people from one continent, but a slavery which embraces the whole of humanity. I want to think firstly for a moment or two with you this afternoon of what God's Word says to us about the reality of our spiritual slavery. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Earlier this year, I was listening to what for me as someone very interested in history was a very interesting program on the radio. It traced the route taken by the African slaves on their way to the American continent. 
and it asked a very interesting question. At what point did these people become slaves? Well, sure, that simple. It's when the ship's captain sold them to their new owners in America. But of course that's wrong. It was earlier than that. Sure didn't it happen when they were sold to the ship's captain at the port of Africa. But that's not right either. These people were slaves long before they got to the port to embark for America. These people became slaves in their own native villages when their tribal chiefs made them slaves. And the thing that struck me listening to that program was these men, these women, they were made slaves not by white men, but by black men. They were made slaves by their own chiefs. When they got to America, when they got to the port of Africa, they were already slaves. Now he says, Jesus, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Let me ask you, what meaning do you take out of that this afternoon? That you do something wrong, that you do something that is forbidden in scripture, and at that point you become a slave to sin. Well, that's not what Jesus means. The Bible says you do something which it forbids because you are already a slave to sin. You've been in spiritual slavery for as long as you have been a human being. King David expresses our condition very well in the fifth verse of Psalm 51. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The reality of our spiritual slavery is that we've been slaves to sin, we've been bound to sin, from as long as we have been a human being. But then Jesus goes on to speak about the imperceptibility of our spiritual slavery. You see, the Jews respond to this statement by Jesus like this. They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. John Newton, who wrote the hymn that we'll sing in a minute or two, was a close associate of William Wilberforce. Now for a number of years, Newton had been employed on board one of the ships that uh, transported slaves from Africa to America. And at first he saw absolutely nothing wrong with what he was doing. Now true, he did have a conscience about the condition and the treatment of slaves, and, and on his ships he made sure that the standards of hygiene were as good as they could be, and indeed he built up a, a bit of a reputation for the small number of deaths in transit among the slaves on board his ship. However, he saw nothing wrong with what he was actually doing as such. And that was a problem with the Jews. They saw nothing wrong with themselves as such. They cannot perceive that they are in spiritual slavery. They are quite content, they are quite happy with what they have. Now they looked forward, of course, to the coming of the Messiah. They longed for the day when this great hero figure, um, you could almost imagine them thinking of King William on the front of an orange banner, longed for the day when he would rise up and he would establish the independence of Israel. And when this great Messiah arrived, they would be there right behind him. They'd be in his army. They'd be supporting his efforts. He would provide the, the visionary leadership and they, by their efforts, would continue towards uh, his, his triumph. The victory, you see, would be their work as well as his leadership. But again, they got it wrong. 
they missed two things. First, the Messiah whom God promised would come not to deal with a political matter, not to deal with a social matter, but to deal with a spiritual matter. It wasn't the political independence of Israel that God sent his Messiah into the world to achieve. It was the liberation of his people from spiritual slavery. And second, the Bible from Genesis to Malachi as they had it in those days was very clear that the Messiah was going to accomplish his task alone without help from anyone else. Indeed it was also very clear that those whom he came to deliver could contribute nothing towards their deliverance.